And good evening. Welcome to Seattle Public Schools Zoom session on a system of well-resourced schools, our vision for our future. My name is Bev Redmond. I am pleased to be your MC for this particular session. We are carrying the session again on Zoom as well as YouTube. And this evening we are pleased to carry this information session in ASL and closed captioning. We're also carrying the session in Somali, Cantonese, Vietnamese, Amharic, and Spanish. Those instructions should be on your screen. You may also see it in the chat. Again, we are carrying the session in ASL, closed captioning, Somali, Cantonese, Vietnamese, Amharic, and Spanish. As we begin, we start all of our sessions, all of our events with a land acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral lands and the traditional territories of the Puget Sound Coast Salish people. We are honored that you would spend part of your evening with us to learn more about the plans for our schools. And as we move forward into the evening, I'd like to tell you what you can expect. With our agenda, we are in the opening session at this particular point in time. And then Dr. Jones, our superintendent, will offer about 20 minutes of remarks and a presentation. And then we will go into questions and answers with our panel that we have here tonight. We have a great number of people who are expected to join us in our Zoom room, and we will do our best to get to all of your questions. However, because we have so many people that we're expecting, if we cannot get to them, we will certainly take the rest or the remainder and place them on our FAQs for our website. We have two goals this evening. Again, one, to provide information to you regarding the future of our schools, and then two, again, answering your questions. We want to spend as much time as we possibly can on those questions. If you have a question tonight, you will use the Q&A function, again, the Q&A function, to help you put your questions in. We have a team that's standing by, waiting to bring those questions over to our moderator. And I'm going to introduce our moderator for the evening. It is Dr. Marnie Campbell. She is our Executive Director of Operations. And as we go around the table, you will also see our Chief Operations Officer, Fred Podesta, also our CFO, Dr. Kurt Buttleman, our superintendent, Dr. Brent Jones. Again, I am Bev Redmond, our chief of staff, and also our deputy superintendent of academics, Dr. Art Jarvis. We are now ready to begin, and I would like to introduce our superintendent, Dr. Brent Jones. Good evening. We have an opportunity and a challenge in front of us to really uh, take account of what we need to do to create a system of well-resourced schools. And we're, we're doing it in the backdrop of where we are facing fiscal instability. We are one of many school districts that are not fully funded, and we are trying to work through those, those challenges. Those challenges are ex experiencing inflation, rising cost of living, our budgets aren't fully funded. We are witnessing a reduction in school age population in our city, and we are experiencing declining enrollment. With those pieces in place, it's gonna, it's, it smacks of us not having stability as we go forward. So as we look at the next steps that we are going to in, endeavor to take, we are looking to how are we creating stability in our school district. So, this slide really speaks to um, the progress we've made towards reaching fiscal stability. In 2023-24 budget, we had a $131 million challenge that we needed to reconcile. 
We did that through a resolution and a, and a task that we called Funding Our Future. The board adopted a, a plan that we came up with and we closed that gap of 131 million. Through that process, we started to ask, the, we asked the community, what would a well-resourced school look like? And so through the budgeting process, we paused to ask the community, how would you like to see the experience of your, of your students in our schools? Later, we took that information and we started to design a plan. Through 23-24, we worked to also re reconcile a budget deficit of $105 million. That process we're engaged in right now and we're trying to, again, reconcile that. And so our process to, our progress to fiscal stability is really uh, challenging for us, but we've taken uh, intentional steps to really try to reconcile what we need to going forward. So as we look at the, the next uh, set of considerations for us in a set, set of well-resourced schools, there are a couple of things that we need to do. We need to look at the path. We need to look, we have a decision point. We need to make sure that we think about, are we going to maintain the current system of schools or are we going to transition to a system of well-resourced schools? If we maintain the current system of schools that we have right now, we have 105 schools, including 29 schools with fewer than 300 students. None of our contigu contiguous districts around us have any schools with fewer than 300 students. If we continue down this current system, we will have to continue to reduce staffing. We will look at increases in elementary and secondary class size. We'll have to reduce or eliminate preschool programming, reduce or eliminate athletics or other after school programs and extracurricular activities. We have to also be thinking about additional reductions for a fourth year in a row of central office staff, perhaps even curriculum adoptions, pausing curriculum adoptions, and thinking about reducing our number of operational staff. And what we really don't want to engage in is renegotiating labor contracts. But that's if we s sustain this system, uh, this current system of schools. If we look at the transition to a system of well-resourced schools, this can facilitate the expansion of elementary education strategies. We can look at providing equitable and consistent mix of services to more students. We can achieve consistent, stable, and comprehensive school staffing and we can make spaces for special education intensive services and pre-K in every building. This is what we're trying to achieve through a stable and balanced district budgets, budgets will leave us to, with consistent and stable staffing. As we look forward to looking at the, the next part of what we're trying to do, we need to be led by guiding principles. Guiding principles let me back up, excuse me. A system of well-resourced schools, let me make, be clear, is about sustainability and stability. This is where we are trying to focus. It's not just a budget exercise, but it's our attempt to bring consistency, predictability, and sustainability to our programming. And as we look at this in the context of uh, our strategic planning, we are about to embark on a next strategic plan in 25, from 25 to, to 2030. And as we look at that, we are looking at areas of governance, funding, staffing, programs and services, and our operations. And as we look at these in the aggregate, all of these together, one of the facets is around school consolidation, but we need to look at a broader plan in preparation for our next strategic plan to really bring sustainability to our district. And so this is really uh, speaking to, this is part of a larger picture for us bringing stability across the district. Next slide, please. So our current situation, SPS has about 48,000 students, housed in 105 school buildings. 73 of those schools serve preschool through our fifth grade students. 29 of them, like I mentioned before, serve less than 300 students. Our proposed plan will consolidate schools serving K through five students in 25-26. So 
So as we look at the guiding principles for a system of well-resourced schools, this is what we are using to excuse me, prepare a preliminary recommendation for our board. We're looking at inclusive learning, special education and inclusionary practices, enhancing service for our multilingual learners, expanding access to advanced learning, and strengthening and stabilizing our neighborhood schools. We want to consider building condition and learning environment. We want to make sure that we're aligned with our projected enrollment we have to be efficient how, as we use our building capacity and service area capacity. We want to make sure that we allocate resources using an equitable system and that we have equitable regional distribution of schools throughout our city. These guiding principles are what we're using to design our plan. As we look at policy, policy 2200, where we're looking at uh, how do we support school school district uh, academic goals. How do we place programs and services ac equitably across the district where students reside? How, do we are, how are we utilizing physical space and resources effectively to assure that instructional and program space needs are equitably met? These, this policy is guiding our work as well as the guiding principles. Next slide, please. So as we look at a system of well-resourced schools, this new model will have fewer buildings that serve preschool to fifth grade students. Each building's capacity would be better aligned with our enrollment, our projected enrollment. Schools will have more students, but they will not be overcrowded. These won't be large, giant buildings with, that are unruly. These are gonna be schools that actually are about 400 to 450 students. This will allow us to have the staffing and the resource allocation in a way that it makes sense for services and programs. And when we have our schools that will not be in use, uh, they will be secured and repurposed until needed again. We asked the community, what is a well-resourced school? What does a well-resourced school look like? And we think about the experience for our students. We want to make sure that we have multiple, teacher per multiple teachers per grade level, stable support staff, inclusive learning for every student, social and emotional learning support. We've heard clearly that we need art, music, and PE teachers at each one of our schools. Stable operational budgets is, is essential, and of course we want our schools to be safe, healthy, and beautiful school grounds, and make, making sure that they have a connection to the community. This is what the community told us a well-resourced school looks like. So this, this slide represents four of our currently enrolled schools and the staffing that corresponds with them. We have a school, school size 515 students on the left side of this graph, all the way to the, the right side of the graph, 165 students. And what you'll see the difference is is more consistent staffing, you'll see more robust staffing, adequate staffing, the larger the school is. We believe the prototypical model for our schools as we go into a well-resourced school is around that 468 uh, student level that you see in the center of the center column in the screen. And so really the takeaway from this slide is to have a larger school gives us more opportunity to have consistent and predictable staffing across the board for our students. So as we transition to a system of well-resourced elementary schools, approximately 23,000 K-5 students are in 23-24 our, in this year, currently served in more than 70 sites. However, the current site utilization is only 65%. When we look at transitioning to a system of well-resourced schools for the year 25-26, K-5 students would be better accommodated in approximately 50 sites that are evenly distributed with about 10 per region. The projected site utilization in that model is around 85%. This is comparable to our middle and high schools. So why talk about consolidation? Essentially, we have too many schools that serve our youngest scholars, they are under-enrolled. 
Empty seats can lead to fewer staffing resources, more staffing adjustments, inequitable offerings across our district. If we maintain the status quo, as I mentioned earlier, we will need to reduce services. This could mean having more students per teacher, reducing our core school staff, or scaling back some of our offerings, perhaps in preschool. So as we look at the timeline, we are, we are in the phase right now of planning. Our, our board asked us to bring back a plan for how will we achieve this set of well-resourced schools? How will we create a system of well-resourced schools? The board gave us that charge in May, and we're coming back in June with some ideas, with a preliminary plan for how that will manifest. As we move into the summer, the board will start to take steps to analyze our work and start to have perhaps hearings with the community around what would they want to hear more, of, more about as we start to go into the phases of implementation. So the bottom line is every student deserves a well-resourced school. We know this, there, there aren't a whole lot of choices that we have in terms of making whole system changes, but one change that we think is going to help us to get to a place of stability is really consolidating our schools so that each school can have adequate, consistent services and programs for our students that deserve them. We know this can be challenging in terms of change, but we are wedded and committed to making sure that we do this in a way that's intentional, that's led by, that centered, that centered students, that's led by community input that we've received, and so that we can make a model that we can ensure our students have the conditions to thrive into the future. And so we want to make sure that we are also, through this process, having opportunities to talk with community about your concerns and your needs. And so we're gonna move into a session now of answering your questions and, and providing you answers for how we might go forward with, with such, a, such a model. And thank you for your time. What other options were considered besides closing schools in order to close the budget gap? Other options should be brought to the community so that we can understand how the superintendent and the team ended up with this decision. Thank you for the, thank you for the question. Um, I think the slide that Dr. Jones was sharing about the decision point is the best sort of summary level of what the, the other alternatives would look like. So um, dilute, diluting staffing resources in schools, taking the, the budget reductions at the school level, um, instead of using funding to, to operationalize those buildings, we'd be diluting some of the services in those buildings would be an, another way of approaching this, um, an alternative to this um, school closure plan. Anything to add? Thank you. This is a question about boundaries. When you adjust boundaries, will you take the opportunity to decrease segregation? For example, by avoiding replicating the traditional redlined zoning. And I'm happy to speak to this one. Um, I work with uh, the enrollment planning team. And as you look at the layout of our city, you can see evidence of redlining in the way our schools are laid out. We're very aware of this, and we're very aware of the need to ensure that we are addressing the historical, um, the history of our city and the way, that our, the way that our city has grown and making sure that with our perspective in 2024, that we're doing all that we can to create beautifully integrated schools. So um, in, in the models that we've looked at, we're required by the state, but we also really voluntarily wanted to look at in the potential boundaries, um, whether or not they bring our schools closer to our overall enrollment as a district in terms of balancing 
uh, demographic balancing. And so any plans that did not do that, we rejected. The plans that we have considered are ones that actually bring us into better balance in terms of creating integrated school communities. Would anybody else like to speak to that? Thank you. Where is Seattle Public Schools going to get the additional funding to cover the large budget deficit? Closing schools will not solve the budget shortfall. Yeah, so closing schools or consolidating schools will uh, help us reduce our, our deficit for sure. However, we are gonna need additional support. We need to have those additional supports through our levy, through our, uh, through our state allocation from, uh, from the legislature. Uh, we, this is a, only a stabilization effort to get us to a point of stability. This isn't an effort where we're going to actually generate revenue. This is really trying to hold steady to what we have. Any further response to that question? Thank you. Schools are already relying upon portable buildings to fit all students. Special education, early education, already struggle to have any place to go in the district. How are you planning on actually providing resources for those and not continuing to push these services to the margins? So I can speak to this a little bit. Again, one of the things uh, it, that we know as our district has evolved, many of our services and programs have, um, have been added to buildings and is sort of at, as space available. And unfortunately, what that has done is it's meant that we haven't always had really an equal or an equitable distribution of opportunities for students. In particular, many of our students who receive intensive special education services cannot attend their home school. And that's something that we know is not best for students, it's not best for families, it's not best for community. So as we design our new, um, our new system of well-resourced schools, we have intentionally looked at capacity and made a, created a design wherein in our K-5 schools we have space for both intensive special education services and potentially for preschool and perhaps before and after school care as well. So that we are building that in, building those services and opportunities by design and not having to do that work of uh, essentially seeking space uh, but really making sure that we're using our buildings as they were intended to be used, prioritizing those services and supports that our students need and deserve. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Uh, one point I guess I would like to add to that is Dr. Jones showed a slide about um, the uh, utilization of the capacity in our elementary school buildings. And we're currently at about 65%. So we're using two thirds of the space of our buildings, the actual built space, and we've deployed 300 portable classrooms. And that kind of shows the disconnect of our current configuration um, with our buildings. We have space that students can get the services they need in the actual buildings and we can reconfigure this. Well, that will not happen in, in the, over the course of one year, but that it, when we talk about well-resourced schools, what we heard the community tell us that um, uh, beautiful buildings and safe buildings are important. So that is one of the resources we're trying to balance with this plan. Thank you. What is your vision for making the Seattle School District the largest per capita contributor to students excelling in STEM fields? Specifically, what initiatives are in place or planned to enhance the STEM curriculum, support teacher training, and foster partnerships with local tech companies and universities? If, if I may take that one. I love the question because it speaks to what we've talked about in, in exercising. Do we go about closing schools and cutting the district or do we work towards a vision? And you're hearing that vision in well-resourced schools. So let me take it to the, the what the questioner is asking. Let there be no mistake, the present system put out by the state, the instability that we have at this point gives us really one basic choice. If we do keep the number of buildings, the only option available to us is to begin to continue to cut staff, to cut programs, 
to work away from the very thing that this questioner is asking for, rather than saying, how can we spend our money not just wisely, but in a planned fashion that stages buildings. We talked about multiple buildings, multiple teachers per grade level. We talked about the support staff. <coughs> That's intended to make it possible for the very thing that this questioner asks, that we can have the partnerships with the, the corporations and the businesses, that we can have a system that essentially is stable from the state to the district, and we can take care of ourselves. Right now, because of McClary and the changes that were made, they not only prohibited us from solving our own problems, but we're having to cut our programs in order to meet the, the limited funding. So the point being that the very vision that this person has in asking that question is a vision that I believe has no end in the Seattle School District. Who else is positioned better than Seattle right. to have the partnerships? I care not whether we're talking aerospace, whether we're talking uh, STEM in every fashion, whether we're talking a digital world, the artificial intelligence crew that's already working in this district would love to take it that next step. Those are some of the same people we're talking about. Do we have to cut them to stay away from the classroom teacher uh, and cutting additional things at their secondary schools? I, I warn on the secondary schools because if we retain the number of elementary schools, the only place we can start to cut is where we have uh, extra locally funded teachers at the secondary schools. And it works over and over and over against what this person is asking. I could go on at great length, as you can tell, I'm passionate about it, because instead of working towards a vision, we're, we're put in a position of, <coughs> if we don't do what we're talking about, we must just cut staff continuously. Thank you. The staffing ratios, and I'm assuming it's the ones that were shown in the slide, are not representative of a well-resourced school. It's what Dr. Jarvis was just talking about, some of our limitations in funding. Will Seattle Public Schools consider improving staffing ratios by adding more librarians, counselors, arts teachers, et cetera, than are currently proposed, especially considering many will be available with the closure of schools? Yes, those opportunities come with more funding. Uh, again, this, this effort is really to sustain what we have, uh, to bring stability to our services and programs, to keep the level of librarians that we currently have uh, in place. It, the, the effort to increase that number will need to come with more funding. And so I, I think Dr. Buttleman may be able to speak to what it takes to increase staffing, but the current allocation is what we want to make sure that we're holding on to. Yeah, I can talk a little bit more about that. The school district allocates staffing, such as the counselor, librarian, teachers, uh, student teacher ratios through a, a funding mechanism of our own development, uh, the waiting, weighted staffing standards model. And bringing the stability, as Dr. Jones is talking about, gives the group that works on that um, the opportunity to think about the future. So when new funding opportunities arise for the district, how do we want to reinvest in those schools going forward? Um, this gives that stability and that basic foundation for when we can start to realize those opportunities. Um, this budget going forward assumes some partnership with the legislature to get to those opportunities that will be uh, in front of the Seattle Public Schools in the future to prioritize things like librarians, counselors, social workers, additional staff in the schools. So there's opportunity here, but the stability is sort of the first step that this uh, system of well-resourced schools consolidation step would bring to the district. Thank you. Explain timing. This change will coincide with the last year of elementary school for children who did not get kindergarten during the pandemic. Did you consider this? And what ideas do you all have to ease transition for this specific class of students? I think that's a powerful question. Um, we all 
are very mindful constantly of the impact of COVID uh, and of the quarantine and the period of time when, when our students were learning at home. I was a principal during that time and definitely saw the incredible work that our staff put in to providing instruction and the incredible toll that it took on our students and families um, to be learning in that way and to not have that access to school. I would say right now, we are engaged in that work. Ever since our students returned, we have been very mindful of the social and emotional needs that they have, which are connected to their intellectual needs. Um, our students, uh, you know, there, there's a, a really intimate connection between your social and emotional identity, the meaning that you find as a learner, and your cognitive capacity as a learner, both of those things go hand in hand. So I would say right now, and, it, and you've seen in the past few years, and the students have demanded additional social and emotional support that they're saying they need right now to be learners, we will continue that support. Um, on a technical note, we are creating um, a lessons that is only a first step and that is only a, an initial tier one step uh, to provide for students and families as we start to make this transition. But we have a full year, potentially, um, to make this transition. We are talking about the 25 and 26 school year. We are interested in, in um, someone wrote at one of our prior community meetings, how are you going to help us grieve and reweave? And I thought that was a beautiful way to express it. Um, there is grief, there is loss when we close school buildings, but we also have an opportunity to reweave, to build and to build beautiful communities. So I think that's a very relevant question, something we will be very mindful of. Dr. Jarvis. I want to comment on this from a perspective. I joined the Seattle School District last July. I was not here last year. The reason I mentioned that in answering this question is I watched this Seattle School District do everything humanly possible to avoid this moment to use every resource available, every federal dollar, every cash reserves, uh, to uh, take care of a $131 million deficit in the previous year, and then stage the next year for, to deal with a $105 million deficit without doing this. Uh, Dr. Jones stepped forth and said, fall of 25, I know I can't avoid it any further. So that being sensitive to the post-pandemic, to the COVID, to the young people that, that suffered through that was foremost in creating the most stable system that this district could put forth for the children. But it also reaches a point where that's the end. After four years of cutting the central staff, after multiple years of exhausting the the, really the fund balance and the contingency funds, when you, when you have nothing left, uh, we will exert, I hope collectively with the, with the public, tremendous pressure on Olympia to assist us in stabilizing. This is happening in school districts throughout the state of Washington. It's not just Seattle. I think Seattle has done an absolutely superb job and I just, felt like I needed to say that and give credit because it's been hard to put it off as long as possible and that's the fall of 25 that we really have to solve this problem. So thank you. I love that the district is moving towards more inclusive and diverse classrooms across the district. I applaud Seattle Public Schools for the bravery in making this move, which I believe truly centers our most vulnerable children. When can parents and I would that families in general expect to hear more about how classrooms will change to meet the needs of various learners in one room? What will universal design for learning look like? What support staff will be present in classrooms? And in what specific ways will services be provided? Thank you. And I will just add, uh, I would invite you to visit any one of our schools in the district right now to actually see this in action. Uh, we have been engaging in inclusion and universal design for learning uh, in some cases for decades in some of our amazing schools. Uh, but this is live 
and well and in practice in many, many of our classrooms. So if you want an, an example of some classrooms to visit, please uh, email me, Marnie Campbell, and I will give you some suggestions. I'll even go with you to visit these classrooms so that you can see how dynamic and exciting these classrooms are. But I will also let someone else respond. Yeah, so since we were the second district in the country to have a, an equity policy in 2012, we've been on that journey ever since to really be uh, inclusive. Uh, it's what we do on a normal basis. Uh, it's ho I'm hopeful that we can take it to the next level. We've, we've disaggregated our data in a way that we understand where the challenges are, where our system has not met the needs of students. And now we're in a phase where we are do, doing something about it. And universal design is one of the tools that we're using in order to create uh, learning environments where students are receiving exactly what they need. And so we're gonna stay on that path. We're gonna stay on that. We're gonna be very intentional about making those opportunities and services available to our students because we know that that's part of what we are. That's part of our DNA at Seattle Public Schools that we lead with equity and we lead with inclusion. And so I'm giving you p pretty much a guarantee that that's our work as we go forward into the future. Just a brief reminder for us to slow our pace just a little bit when we're speaking. We do have an interpretation team that's trying to keep up with us. Thank you. We get a little too excited about these wonderful <laughs> yes. things that we're doing. Yes. Thank you. Passion. What is going to happen with the empty buildings? The district already has so many vacant school buildings across the city. Has there been discussion on converting old schools to shelters or to help keep families from being priced out of Seattle? Um, thank you very much for the question. Uh, the district um, uses all its school buildings at the moment. We um, are constantly under construction, so um, the buildings that we have that aren't in use are often interim sites while we're um, modernizing or doing construction at other buildings. But uh, we will absolutely, we recognize that school buildings beyond the educational purpose are a community asset for the surrounding neighborhood. So we will, um, for each uh, school that uh, may be closed for a period of time, we'll work with the local community um, and keep the buildings in our inventory, but to make sure that they're still useful to the community in terms of green space, recreational space. We have many partners that use our buildings for childcare, for uh, recreational programs. We will work with our partners in city government and other agencies and local communities to keep the buildings activated, maintained, and keep the green spaces available to the local community as we continue to plan for our enrollment needs in the future. And um, some may per be permanently repurposed. Uh, there be those I think would be the exception overall, but um, most will uh, remain a community asset that we would um, plan for uh, in partnership with the local neighborhood. Thank you. Since you're closing 20% of the schools, are there plans to reduce central office staff by 20%? Will you reduce the number of directors of schools or assistant superintendents or other leaders in the central office? We have, uh, over the last four years, reduced the number of uh, people at central office, and central office uh, comprises a lot of different services and programs for uh, for our schools, but specifically around uh, senior level administrators. Uh, we have had reductions uh, consistently over the last several years. We've had, a, we've, we're actually below average in terms of number of uh, resources, percentage of uh, salary and benefits at the senior level. And so we will continue to make uh, adjustments as we need to. Uh, the 20% number may not be a number that is going to be where we go, but however, we will continually be as efficient as possible. And our job is to really keep cuts as furthest away from schools as possible. But at the same time, central office provides services to schools that are important. And so we want to make sure that we don't cut too far so that our schools aren't getting served well. 
I can just share a little bit more detail on that. The central office for Seattle Public Schools is about 5.5% of the total for the 24-25 proposed budget, and this is down from 6.4% of the total in the previous year. So as Dr. Jones indicated, there's been some reductions already, and as part of contemplating further reductions in the 25-6 year, it's what the, all things will be looked at for sure. Thank you. Why are you wasting money on remodeling schools when we are in such a huge deficit? Um, we operate many school buildings. We're having a discussion now about how many we should have, but um, as we said, the building itself is a resource. Um, uh, having students attend a school that does not meet code, that does not provide uh, air quality, is not secure, is not um, uh, a reasonable strategy for us to take to just on the basis of saving money. Um, in addition, our capital improvements that we make to buildings are a totally different revenue source than what we're talking about now in terms of our operating fund um, challenges. So um, there, there are different sources of revenue available to us um, and we need to continue to invest in the buildings that we have because buildings are where learning occurs and um, we don't really consider um, making a building safe, having the right capacity, making um, the security improvements, and um, maintaining the roof and the, and the building grounds, uh, there, in no way can that be considered a waste of money because uh, students need to be um, in a, a constructive and positive learning environment. Thank you, and we definitely heard that when we met with community last summer. Many of the things they said that they loved the most, you said that you loved the most about your schools, is the building, the beautiful common space, the beautiful grounds, those things that, that are truly the heart of a community that welcome you in and create that generous and gracious space for learning. As a parent of elementary school children, I know the lack of available after school care is the top reason for being forced to choose private school. Can this issue be corrected and enrollment improved? I, a brief answer for that is that one of the things we're trying to do in create well-resourced schools is to be able to have in every neighborhood a stable elementary school that does it all. As, as far as we can go, with our resources from early childhood, through special education services, through multi-language services, through counseling, librarian, but also to include the child care, so that before and after school, to every extent possible, that that can be provided in the neighborhood and in that school. Uh, we simply cannot do that with the tiny schools that are sim that don't have the room, they don't have the space, uh, and we we need to be able to have an adequate facility to also enable that reaching out for the services. There are some wonderful partners that will assist us with with childcare in the neighborhood schools, and we can do that with uh, the 50 well-resourced schools we're talking about. Uh, it w again won't be overnight but it's something we can definitely add and include in the well-resourced, and we will. Thank, thank you. Where did the number 20 come from? Why do 20 need, schools need to be closed? Did you consider starting with a smaller number as a pilot of sorts so that we learn the best possible way to support children and their families as well as teachers? So the goal of this type of planning was not really to look at what number of schools to reduce, but what is the correct number of schools to serve our elementary school population. So we're trying to determine what is the system, what is the shape, and what is the quantity of schools that would best accommodate 23,000 um, uh, K through five students. So that leads you to something on the order of 
50 schools, um, given that, again, the sweet spot for enrollment in an individual school on average is 400 to 450. And that's, so the remainder is really what, where the number 20 comes from. But the point was not to find schools to de-emphasize, but to find schools which are um, positioned based on their building, based on their enrollment characteristics, to become well-resourced schools. And, and that's really the challenge here, is to, to roll out a new system of elementary schools where each school can provide um, a comprehensive set of services uh, in the local neighborhood. And if I may add on that, uh, I think that was 100% correct, but the part I would add was that there were specific criteria used to look at the sites and say which of these schools can support a well-resourced school, which of the facilities, what, what location, and it has been a tremendous amount of work. It was not just an arbitrary number, let's, let's find 50 schools and, and close 20 plus, but rather what would it take in terms of, as uh, Fred just described, to get there and what are the criteria that each must meet in order to be well-resourced, adequate, and, and stable over time. So I, I, I want to give credit to the number of people who have worked diligently week after week after week to try to figure out the best schools and the adequate number to be able to serve this population and consider the next 10 years the live births and what's ahead for us and what's what's happening in Seattle. And I think it's been very precise, it's been very technical, and it's, uh, it's darn good work. Thank you. Dual language immersion has been an amazing for exposing my child to other cultures at a level we could never provide if he wasn't immersed daily and surrounded by native speakers at his option school. I hope that maintaining and expanding dual language instruction or immersion instruction is part of the well-resourced schools plan, especially if equity is a priority. Can you say how DLI programming will be affected? So I can speak a little bit to that. Uh, we know that dual language immersion, dual language instruction um, is something that builds on the brilliance of our students who are multilingual. Um, it also closes gaps of an opportunities for our students who are multilingual. It is a powerful strategy. Um, and we want to make sure that it is available particularly to our students who are multilingual, who come to us speaking another language. Um, so it, it, we are looking at then making sure that those services are available where our students live, making sure they have access to them. That's consistent with policy 2200 and making sure that we're uh, looking at our overall approach across the district to prom promoting and providing that uh, service opportunity for our students. And at the macro level, this whole effort is really, again, and I always sound like a broken record, but to sustain our programs, sustain our services. And so we're not talking about reducing the, the service offerings and the program offerings. We're actually talking about how do we shore them up. And so our DLI programming and dual language programming should sustain as we go forward. So I just wanted to give people some reassurance on that. Thank you. Are you going to address the top questions asked on Thought Exchange? I want to thank all of our community that has participated in the Thought Exchange and still invite those who would like to participate or go back and rank your ideas and your thoughts. Yes, we'll be taking a look at all of that information. Uh, we expect to sit down as soon as tomorrow and take a look as we close our sessions tonight and take a look at those pieces of information and make sure that we share that with our team so that we can finalize any plans that we have. And one of the points of us uh, taking on questions from, from the community is to really get your insights as to what you're thinking. Uh, this will inform what we produce ultimately in terms of our planning. And so we invite you to 
uh, share through thought exchange, through these question and answer sessions that we've been having. And we really need those inf that information to, to shape uh, what we're trying to establish in terms of a well-resourced system. And so uh, it's really important, so I wanna just double down and encourage you all to uh, submit questions, submit comments, uh, so that we can be mindful of what, what your concerns are and what your brilliance is in helping us to shape this. Can I just put a quick plug in for the, the value of these opportunities of questions and answers from the community? Uh, in addition to the thought exchange, there's a frequently asked questions page on the Well Resource School page. And in the, the ones that relate to financial situation or others, we've been updating those regularly based on the, the questions we're getting in these uh, forums. So thank you very much for the engagement on that. And uh, if you see things out there that don't make sense to you, do not hesitate to reach out and ask for clarification. We're trying to be as responsive as we can to the questions that are coming forward um, as this goes on. Thank you. And I have a great one here, actually, that um, is, is just a really cool question. Has anyone looked at how elementary enrollment could be increased by moving the kindergarten entrance cutoff from five by August 31st to the end of December? Um, we have studied that, but I think it's a great question. I think we always want to look at, again, opening those opportunities for our students and families. Um, so I think that's an example of, of input from the community that, that helps us to think differently um, about some of the ways that we operate. If a student is attending a school that will not be closed, is there a chance the student will still be moved? Um, in some of our models, yes. Um, in some of our models, we have had to look at, in order to, again, to create these well-resourced school communities, we have had to do some adjustment um, of potential draft boundaries between schools. None of this is finalized, but yes, it is very possible that students um, would be moving from their cur current school, even if it's not a school that is closing. And this next one, I think, has two different sides to it and I think will be good for discussion. Why are schools so under enrolled and what is the plan to bring students back to schools? So why do we think schools are so under enrolled? Dr. Jones's presentation has shared some of that information but I think it bears repeating if anyone wants to reiterate. So we have uh We've had the opportunity to actually take a deeper dive and do an enrollment study here soon so that we can pinpoint some of the details around what are the root causes of, the, of our enrollment declines are. However, we know that through our uh, professional group that has helped us to look at uh, enrollment that it's around live births. How many, how many people are having school age children right now? Uh, affordability. Um, and there's, there's a whole host of factors going into that, but we are also mindful of there's, we, we, do, we do this research, we do this uh, over and over to make sure that we understand the nature of the challenge, but there's also a, uh, a theory that we're not offering uh, quality services. And I'd, I'd be challenged, I would challenge uh, people on that because our, our schools are, our teachers are fantastic. Our principals, our school leaders are uh, on point in terms of offering the right type of services and programs to, to our students. Uh, but there are real factors that go into the uh, enrollment that we have in our city right now. And we're gonna be continue to study that. But we wanna make sure that we're continuing to offer quality instructional services so that we can be attractive to families. But I would invite, you know, any of those uh, factors that they can put a finer point on? Well, one of the points I would emphasize, we've looked at what happens over the next five to 10 years. We know currently how many babies were born in the last four or five years. Those are already here. They happen to be one year old or two years old. And we know what those numbers look like. We also know how many seniors were graduating the short version was we're losing, losing at least 500 students a year 
fewer kindergartners entering and more seniors graduating than, than we bring in. So that's a continuing pattern. It's one of the things that's driving us to look at how many schools do we need and how do we set up well-resourced schools that are stable. Uh, again, back to that very early comment about the fork in the road. If we, if we do nothing about our number of facilities and our number of schools, then our option is to continue to cut staff in, in throughout the district. That is not a design that works for the very question that's being asked. How do we recruit people? How do they know that they've got a really solid school that their child will attend and that, that it is stable? So we have to give a stable foundation or we're lost at the very first step. Secondly is we need to be able to assure a school, a staff, a neighborhood, a whole community that we're working towards a vision of what we're developing, what we're adding. Uh, if that's arts and music, if that's STEM, if that is space, if it is physical fitness, uh, whatever those may be, there are neighborhood schools that are developing that. It's not as a special school down the road where you have to go to, it's at, in my neighborhood. And it's the very thing that will suffer if in fact we can't stabilize the enrollment and we have nothing left in the support services for it. So try to make those schools attractive, try to make them vibrant and energy driven and be able to have the staff that <coughs> is feeling wonderful about what's ahead and what they're building rather than who's next to be cut and how do I keep doing this without the, the support I, I'll reference for a minute a, a school principal at an elementary level that has no assistant and has uh, fewer and fewer and fewer, if any, counselors, librarians, support staff. Uh, that's a good way to burn a principal right to the ground. And it's, it's not what <coughs> builds that vibrant school. So back to the, the very question that's being asked, how do we create that that energy-driven school that's based on vision, that's based on what we can create, and how to position our staff, principals and teachers, to do the marvelous job that they can do uh, when they're not being uh, crushed by inadequate support. <laughs> Thank you. We will uh, answer two more questions live, but again, we will continue to compile these questions as we did from our prior sessions and make sure that we are updating our frequently asked questions. Have you completed your required equity analysis for how these closures will impact those furthest from educational justice? And when will we have access to that report? Um, so racial equity analysis was actually one of the first things we started with. This is about ensuring that every single school in the city, regardless of fundraising at that school, regardless of of where that school is located, regardless of the size of, of, well, not regardless of the size, but that we're setting schools up to be the size where they can have all of the things that our students need and deserve. In particular, um, close to I think all of our hearts and what we heard from our community was access to, to art and music. Um, those are things that are live and are the heart of our Seattle public schools. We're known for it. But many of our elementaries are not able to currently offer both. We think that every student should have both. Um, so the very origins of this work are rooted in racial equity, making sure that all of our students have those things uh, that we think all students should have. Um, the racial equity analysis asks us to do community engagement. It asks us to disaggregate that data. And it asks us to analyze um, unintended impacts of any change or decision. So our engagement sessions have been a critical part thus far in our racial equity analysis, both last summer and most recently. Who, um, who responded to us? What were their voices? And then looking at the proposed, any proposed closures and any proposed new school communities to make sure that um, if we consider the impact of changing schools, that we are not disproportionately impacting our, our students of color, students furthest from educational justice. So that work is ongoing, um, but we will be publishing at least the first phase of our racial equity analysis 
um, along with any potential planning documents that are coming out in the next while um, as we work with our school board and with you. Um, a racial equity analysis is, is intended to be a work in progress. So it will be something that we revisit at every phase of planning in our work. We are looking at the impacts on our students and making sure uh, that we are aware of who is uh, receiving disproportionate impact um, of any decisions that we're making. One final question. I'm gonna find one. Sorry. How can our SPS community advocate for more state funding for schools? Can we remove the local levy cap that is contributing largely to our budget deficit? Yeah, so yes, that, that's, uh, that's called regionalization. Um, we've we've uh, gone to the legislature, talked to our, our delegation around uh, our opportunities to get more revenue into our school districts. So I, I think there's uh, an opportunity that we're gonna be having over the next several months for us to be able to uh, give, give the community more information about what specific ask they can make of our legislature. We're looking at transportation, special education, materials, and the like to really uh, advocate for the resources that we need at Seattle schools. And so I know there's a lot of energy with our community around what, get, what they can do. And so we'll take some time to, to shape what those are. We'll prioritize what the needs are and really give uh, folks uh, a direction in terms of what would be most helpful to the school district. I would add a comment that's more technical, but this coming year at the legislature is the beginning, the planning for a new biennium. Uh, it is not the second year where you're adding on to a budget that's already adopted. This is the year to convince the legislature that the implementation of McCleary had some serious consequences. You're seeing that in districts from Vancouver to Bellingham, you're seeing that in Moses Lake, you're seeing it in Ellensburg, and certainly seeing that in Seattle. I think there's a tendency by the legislature at times, and I don't mean this is throwing rocks, but a tendency to wait too long. If we miss this cycle, it will be virtually uh, two years later before they even change the system, and after that will be a year before you see any effect. Uh, that is too late. We need people with us uh, talking to the legislators right now. Special education, <coughs> the deficits that school districts are suffering and having to come out of their own levies to pay the bill that is not being carried by the state would be a great example of something that needs to be fixed. At the moment, it's in the study session that will take another year at the legislature and won't help us. Uh, our transportation was set to be changed to a new system last year, but the House and the Senate couldn't agree on what the solution was, and there was no solution. So now is the perfect time. That is the, one of the best questions of the night. We need our patrons to understand this needs to be solved to give us a stable funding system. I want to thank everyone on the panel for all of the questions being answered this evening. Again, we will ad answer additional questions and host them on our FAQ page. You can certainly head to seattleschools.org and make sure that you click right there. There's, a, I believe, an icon or a top picture that can take you into the Well Resourced Schools Hub where you can find all kinds of information and background on our efforts. Before we conclude tonight, I do want to offer the final word to our superintendent, Dr. Jones. Yeah, I just want to say thank you. We are trying to create this system of well-resourced schools. I thank you for your attentiveness on what we're trying to do. I thank you for your interest. I thank you for your engagement. Uh, we want, to, want you to rest assured that we're doing everything in our power to really stabilize our school district in a way that we can create the conditions for our students to thrive. And so again, thank you for uh, your time and attention on this matter. Appreciate you. 
Again, thank you to the panel. Also want to thank our interpretation team, as well as our SPS TV crew and our public affairs team for all of the support this evening. We have uh, considered it an honor to be able to engage with our community to take and bring information back and forth to you. Our next time before you will be bringing our best work, our best thinking, to our board this month regarding the future of our schools. Again, please head to seattleschools.org to see our FAQs and to visit our web hub. Please continue to be safe and we will see you soon with additional information. Thank you. Good evening. <laughs>